office and the Aberdeen office, which is in the northeast Wales. And the Aberdeen office is actually the head office for the consultancy. So 100% of our profits go straight back into North Wales Wildlife Trust. So over the last few years, we've given £80,000 roughly per year, um, with the total of the 10 years just under £450,000. Uh, the projects range in scale from small projects to larger infrastructure and wind farm projects as well. So there's quite a variety of work which we undertake. And um, so this is the team. Um, this was last week. Uh, we have now lost the person in the middle, Peter, who's gone for a bit of a career change. Um, but there's me on the left, on the right, sorry. Um, and then Tim, who started with us a couple of years later in 2013 followed by Kimar in 2019 next to Tim, and then Lawrence and the Grey, and then Lucy who started with us in 2015. So we're a relatively small team, but we use a lot of local subcontractors to help out on surveys. So the kind of work we do, <coughs> sorry, um, as I mentioned, does vary dramatically. Um, much of the first initial work that we do is called preliminary ecological appraisal or otherwise used to be known as phase one survey and this is when at the start of development people want a sort of overall view of the site and the ecology to see how the plan works would affect the habitats and the species on site. So other works we do are the species surveys such as bats which Kimo will go into in a minute Great crested newts, water voles, otters, dormice, reptiles, and invasive species. A lot of our work also requires um, supervision. So, once um, planning has been obtained, quite often there'll be supervision needed to ensure that the works are carried out as they're supposed to be. So, this could be vegetation management with regards to reptiles to make sure that reptiles aren't harmed, or it could be um, bats supervision of roof stripping which we'll discuss later. Uh, we also put together license applications so once um, a development has gone through planning and received planning often licenses are required from NRW to enable them to undertake the work legally and as well as this we'll do species monitoring such as um, monitoring of bat houses or monitoring of dormouse boxes and monitoring great crested newt ponds to um, ensure that the numbers are, are being maintained. And since last year, 2019, we've actually got a habitat creation side of Enbus Ecology. And we had done some of this work beforehand, but this was using subcontractors, but now we have Lawrence who's in-house who carries out habitat management and creation work, mainly still focused in North East Wales, but we would like to do some more in North West Wales as well. As well as this, we also do quite a bit of work for the Trust themselves. Um, unlike other members of staff within the Trust, we are purely sort of working on contracts which vary all the time. So we have a bit more flexibility in our work plan. Um, so we, we've done things like scoping studies for living landscape projects, um, management plan reviews for the nature reserves. Um, I helped manage the Core Score project a few years ago where we had just under a quarter of a million pounds to spend in about five months. So that was quite a challenge and also just species work such as Great Crested Newt surveys. <coughs> so the people we work for, uh, it does vary. As I mentioned, a lot of our clients are actually individual house owners who either come to us directly or through architects and planning consultants. So people who are looking at doing extensions or converting an outbuilding or Another one which is quite popular at the moment is if they've got some land is putting up some yurts or um, glamping pods. Uh, we do do work for councils as well. We've done a lot for Denbyshire Council over the years and also housing developers. So Brenner Construction we work with a lot, beach developments and then more recently wind construction and reed construction as well. Um, some of our bigger projects have been working with Dong Energy, who are now Orsted, and that was on a large offshore wind farm. And we did a lot of the surveys with another consultancy and then took on the ecological clerk of roles work, um, which kept us going for quite a few years. That was a, a big project. 
and we also work with Hanson um, in northeast Wales carrying out um, grey crest newt monitoring and ensuring and trapping and just ensuring that they're following the, the management plan which is put in place. Um, we're currently working with other consultancies as well as we are a relatively small consultancy but local and some of the larger consultancies use us instead of having to travel far um, from further afield and at the moment we're doing a lot of work with APEM and Welsh Water. Uh, these are just a few photos of the type of habitat creation works we do and the one which is actually missing is some very good woodland planting which has been carried out on a pylon route and so there's some roundabouts which have been created some road verges and then this year we've actually invested in a tractor and a baler which can be seen in the middle picture so yeah it's quite a variety of work um, which has been great to develop the other thing we do have as a wildlife trust we actually work in collaboration with other wildlife trust consultancies so there's a network of over 22 and I've been quite involved with this group and we do training network opportunities as well. So it's a great way to get together and also to collaborate on some bigger projects. So I'm going to pass you over to Kima, who's going to talk to you about bats and bat surveys. Hi, good evening, everyone. Sorry, I couldn't find my mute button then. Can everybody hear me okay? I Just nod <laughs> for those who can see me. <laughs> okay, hi. So I'm, uh, I'm going to talk about bats in ecology and what our work with bats involves. And it's going to be a very brief overview because it's a minefield when you get into bat surveys and bat mitigation. But yeah, hopefully it'll just give you an overview of what we do. So all bats are protected under the Wildlife and Countryside Act and they are a European protected species. So therefore it's against the law to kill, injure or disturb a bat or disturb or destroy its roost or resting place. So with that in mind, when there's any works that may impact bats or a building or a site that may have bats on it or has the potential to have bats on it, they need a bat survey first. So this is where we come in. So a little bit about bats. So we've got 18 species of bats in Britain, 17 breeding species and 12 in North Wales. So these are the ones in red here. So we've got a couple of big bats like the noctule and the serotine. We've got the pipistrelle bats, which are the most common really in the UK. Brown long eared quite common as well. And um, we've got greater and lesser horseshoe. Lesser horseshoe is a lot more common than the greater horseshoe in North Wales. And then we've got a few, uh, the myotis species such as brants, whiskered, uh, natteras, in uh, Dorbentons. Okay. Okay, so bat ecology. Bats are the only flying mammal in the world. Well, apart from flying foxes, which we're not going to get into here. But uh, they're nocturnal, so they sleep during the day and they come out at night to feed on insects. And in order to do this, they use echolocation to navigate where they produce high frequency sound waves and use the echoes that bounce back from these objects to see them in the dark. So most UK bat species are crevice dwelling. And this is where they took themselves away into little cracks or holes to roost. And you can see the picture here, there's little natteras in between two sort of bits of concrete brick. They only need a tiny space to tuck into. And then we have sort of free hanging bats like the lesser horseshoes in the picture on the right. And these three are actually in our store by the office. They uh, roost in there during the day in the summer. And uh, brown long eards as well will hang from ridge beams and roofs. They, they will uh, crevice dwell, but they, they can hang as well. Okay. So bats have various roost types that they use throughout the year. Uh, maternity roosts in the summer months and this is where the breeding females gather to have their young and it can contain very high numbers of bats like literally hundreds and hundreds of bats all in one roost and um, the day roosts that's basically what we call where they where they sleep during the day before they come out at night and um, they have night roosts so this is 
just where they'll stop during the night if they need a rest or they want to stop to eat or digest or just take a break from foraging. Um, hibernation roosts during the winter, so these are usually underground, but they will hibernate in trees and buildings. They just need somewhere where they've got a steady cool temperature and it's, it's not too dry for them. And then they have transitional roosts. So this is sort of between the summer and the winter roosts when they move into different places or stop off somewhere. Or they also have mating and swarming roosts in the autumn where the males and females gather to mate. Okay. So bat surveys make up a massive proportion of our work. <laughs> Most of it is bat surveys. And uh, as Rianne says, so a lot of them are for individual planning applications. So it's when somebody wants to convert a barn into holiday accommodation, that's a popular one, or you know, knock down a garage or something, put an extension on a building, we'll come and do the bat surveys to make sure there's no bats there or to see what bats are there. So the surveys we carry out, uh, the preliminary roost assessment, tree assessments, emergent surveys, backtracking transit surveys, static surveys. I will go into more detail about these ones afterwards. And um, we'll also do DNA analysis of any droppings we find. We can send them off and get them analysed and they can tell us what species it is. And hibernation surveys where we go into a, a known hibernation roost and we can count the bats that are hibernating. This is quite often used in monitoring, especially with lesser horseshoes. Okay. So the preliminary roost assessment or PRAs, this is the initial bat survey we carry out to determine if the building has any evidence of bats or more importantly has any potential for bats to use it. So we follow the good practice guidelines that are shown here and uh, after the survey we can classify the building as having low, moderate or high roost suitability and this will help determine what further surveys if any are required after this initial survey. Okay so in a PRA first thing we look for is evidence of bats within the building or the site we'll go with the building with this one so evidence of bats you look for bat specimens so either an actual bat within the building or you know, a dead bat, as often the case is on the floor. Droppings, we rely on finding droppings a lot to tell us that bats are in there. Their feeding remains, such as the wings of a moth that have been left after BLEs eat them a lot. And we can we can often tell BLEs are in, oh sorry, that's brown long ears. BLEs are in a loft if we can find uh, moth wings. Their fur oil staining and urine splashes. These are always listed as things to look for, but you very rarely see them. Or if you do, you don't always know that it's a mark from a bat. It could be anything. We don't really rely on these, but you know that they can be evidence of bats. And squeaking noises. If you can hear bats squeaking in the roof, then you can assume that they're in there. So <laughs> where to look? So when you go into a building and start looking for evidence of bats, um, it's basically look everywhere because they can, they can leave droppings and they, they, they themselves can hide anywhere. So the droppings can be on the floor, on the surfaces of furniture, behind wooden paneling, behind curtains, on mantelpieces. Just be very thorough, check everywhere, behind you know peeling wallpaper. And then uh, so inside cupboards and chimneys here, this is because lesser horseshoe bats can be found in the funniest places and you can sometimes find them hanging up inside a cupboard. You can find BLEs hanging up inside a chimney. Just check everywhere if you're doing a, an inspection of a building. Okay, so more often than not, we find that bats tend to use the roofs of buildings to roost and this is what you generally associate bats with using roofs, don't you? So we have to inspect these as well and it involves a lot of crawling around loft spaces and watching roofs to see if bats fly out and there's various areas on a roof that they can use so there's a list here the top of the gable end top of chimney breasts ridge and hip beams they only need the tiniest gap to a uh, to roost in just a tiny little hole to climb into or to gain access into the roof void 
So uh, between the tiles and roof lining, you can imagine how small that gap is, but that's enough. A bat can crawl under that tile and that's its roost. It's quite happy in there. So, even if we don't find evidence of bats within a building, it doesn't mean that they aren't using it. We then have to assess the building for its bat potential. Okay, so to do this, sorry, wait for the next slide. So we're looking for all available access points and potential roost and features within the building. So as I said, they only need tiny little holes, tiny little gaps that they can crawl into. And there's some examples on this slide. You can see all the red circles, there's little gaps under ridge tiles, under lead flashing in the eaves, top of the gable end. In the bottom right photo, there's an arrow pointing to the barge board and that's, that'll be just a tiny little gap there under the barge board, which goes into the roof and that's a brown long-eared roost. So you, you have to be sort of quite meticulous when you're looking at these buildings to find all these tiny little holes because when you come back to do an emergence survey, these are the holes you need to watch to see what if the bats are going to come out of them. Okay. So tree assessments. We also assess trees for bat potential. We, uh, we initially assess the trees from the ground with binoculars and high powered torches. And this is to see if we can see any cracks or crevices and knot holes. And uh, this is if somebody either wants to fell the trees or they want to build something right next to the trees. We'll need to determine if there's bats using them. So if there are potential roost features that we can see from the ground, such as these cracks, crevices, knot holes, or if we can't see enough, if there's too much leaf coverage or ivy, and things, then we'll have to carry out another survey, which can be a tree climbing survey where we actually climb the tree with an endoscope and look in the features, or again, an emergence survey where we'd stand by the tree at dusk and watch if any bats come out. So like with the buildings, the trees are assessed on their suitability, suitability for roosting bats from negligible to high suitability, depending on the number of roosting features available and the available surrounding habitat. So you can see on the left, this is how they classify the trees at the minute. This is up for review. So this could well change on a, how trees are classed, but this is, this is what we currently use. And I won't, I won't read it all out and go through them. Basically, the more features and the better habitat, the higher the potential. So examples of roosting features that we look for are knot holes where branches fallen off or the tree sort of got rid of its own branch and it's made the knot hole, woodpecker holes, uh, lifted bark, any cracks and splits in the trunk or the branches, and uh, hazard beams, which are horizontal limbs that split down the middle. They're especially favoured by bats because the split tends to go quite far up into the branch and they can get quite deep. So these pictures here show some examples of cracks in trees and the first one's sort of where the tree's starting to split and there's a crack down the trunk and then you can see some lifted bark and then the one on the right it's there's lots of cracks and it sort of looks like it's falling apart doesn't it however these three trees would actually all be quite low potential for bats because while it looks like there's lots of holes and crevices and things none of them go deep enough to offer like sufficient protection from the weather and external factors so it, is, it can be difficult assessing trees. You think something's got loads of holes and cracks, and then when you start looking into it, you think actually a bat probably wouldn't use them. Okay. So if a building or a tree shows any potential for roosting bats, then we'll carry out an emergence or a re-entry survey. This is where we stand and watch the building at dusk to see where the bats emerge from or just before dawn and we watch the bats re-enter the building and we can pinpoint where they're roosting or where they're entering within the building. So we'll use bat detectors that convert the high frequency calls of bats into a sound that we can hear. And these can also record the bat calls and produce sonograms so we can analyze them afterwards. And this can tell us what species it is and what they're doing as well by listening to the bats we can tell whether they're commuting or foraging or social calling and we can we can actually learn a lot from listening to the bats on these surveys 
So we'll do up to three emergence or re-entry surveys, depending on the potential of the site or the building or how many bats are found on the first survey. So we've got some examples of calls here. So that was a noctule, which is uh, one of our bigger bats, and you can sort of hear the chip chop. He's got a swipe, uh, quite a slow call. And this one is Pipistrel. So that's got more of a, we say a wet slap sound for the pipistrel. And they, they do sound very different, those calls. I know if, if you've not heard them before, they sound exactly the same, but once you get your ear in, you can hear the differences. And this is how we tell the species apart. And this last one is a, a brown long-eared. So that's also known as the whispering bat and you can see why because it's very quiet and very fast and very hard to hear and these ones are quite often missed on emergent surveys which is why it's brilliant that we have them recording as well so we can check them when we get back. Okay. So we can also carry out backtracking surveys. This is where we start a couple of hours before dawn on the site and we listen out for the bats and try and follow them back to the roost. It's where they're roosting and it is as difficult as it sounds. It's, it's obviously very hard when it's half dark and you, you're trying to follow a bat between trees and buildings to find out where it's roosting. But you, they can work and especially if you've got a fair few bats going back to the same roost, they can be quite effective. Or we can carry out transect surveys. So this is if we have to survey a large area and we want to know bat species and numbers that are active within the site. So there are various methods, but they usually involve walking around the site, stopping at marked points to record the bats for a set number of minutes, just a couple of minutes. And then we can plot it on a map like this one. And it just gives a general idea of bat species on the site and whereabouts and what time as well that they appear on the site. So the number of transect and bat tracking surveys that we do for a site would depend again on the habitat, and how suitable it is and what the proposed works are. Okay, and static detector surveys are extremely useful in determining the bat activity in an area or within a loft space. So these will record bats and they'll record all night long for however long the battery lasts. It can be a long time. And um, we leave them in for a minimum of five nights. And we'll tie them either to a tree or something on site or put them in a loft. And it just records all the, bats, all the bats that pass within that area. So these surveys can be extremely valuable in recording bats using a site or a loft space, especially if you have a moderate or high potential building and you've done an emergent survey on it and you don't see anything come out. And you can't believe that bats would not be using this building. You can leave a static detector in the loft and it will tell you then exactly what bats are using the loft and when. So if bats are found, what happens then? So if bats are found using the building or the site that's intended for works, we need to look at whether the works are going to affect the bat species and more importantly, how the works are going to impact the favorable conservation status of the species. So, for example, someone's demolishing a building that's used as a maternity roost by 50 pipistrels. This is going to have a bigger impact on the species than if someone's demolishing a garage that's used by one individual bat as a night roost. So we need to take all this into account when we're writing our report and uh, when we're thinking about mitigation and compensation. So we'll detail all this in the report and um, the mitigation is to prevent or significantly reduce the risk to bats during the works and the roost during the works. 
and we provide compensatory measures or enhancements such as providing a new roost or doing works at a certain time of year. For instance, if a building is very unlikely to be a hibernation roost, we'd suggest doing the works over the winter when the bats aren't there, so you're not disturbing the bats. Or if it's a roost that could be used at any time of year, we'd say, okay, do the works in March or April between hibernation and breeding, or in September again between breed and hibernation. So the bats are active, but you're less likely to be disturbing an important roost. So once we write the report, it gets submitted with the planning application of the site. And then once planning permission has been granted, we need to obtain a derogation European Protected Species license from NRW. And that essentially gives the permission to disturb or destroy the bat roost under very strict conditions and a strict working method and mitigation. And then all the works to the roost will be supervised by a licensed ecologist. And afterwards, we'd carry out an audit once the works are complete, just to ensure that everything has been done in compliance with the license method statement. Okay, so we will supervise any works that are around the known bat roost, yeah, usually roof stripping. We, we do a lot of roof stripping supervisions. So we check the inside of the roof and the loft space see if there's any bats in there and externally we check any um, holes under the tiles or features that we think the bats might use. We do all this just before the works to make sure there's nothing there and then we stay with the roofers or the construction workers while they strip off the tiles and the fascias and anything that the bats might be under the barge boards and we basically watch to make sure that they're doing everything carefully with caution and to spot a bat if there's one there because you wouldn't believe how difficult it is to see a bat if you haven't seen one before especially they're just tiny little balls of fluff just sat on some roof and felt and they could look like any other bit of moss or mud so uh yeah we are there to point out <laughs> the bats if uh, if they find them don't notice especially so then if a bat doesn't if we find a bat there and it doesn't fly off on its own straight away we will capture it and put it into a bat box so you can see there's a little brown long-eared bat there we found under a tile and he went in the bat box that's on the floor there just behind my glove and he went up into a tree on the site and you know he was safe and unharmed and you know probably a bit lost when he came out <laughs> for a second but it's, it's yeah he was safe it was fine <laughs> okay so bat mitigation there are various ways to mitigate for works done to a bat roost. There are many, many options and everything is dependent on lots of things, but mainly the status of the roof of, of the roost before the works. So for example, what type of roost it was, whether it was a maternity roost or a night roost, and what species were using it. So as mentioned earlier, some species such as lesser horseshoe bats, they need an open space to fly in and hang from and they need a big entrance because they can't crawl so they need to be able to fly in hang up in the roost and then fly back out again so they need very specific requirements if we're mitigating for lesser horseshoes brown long-eared and natterers they will dwell in crevices but they need an open space to fly in before they emerge or they like an open space to fly in before they emerge that's what they tend to choose normally so when you're mitigating for these species, you can allocate an area within the development and dedicate it just to the bats. So the example here is a, they were converting a building and they built an extension on the end and dedicated that extension bit just to the brown long ears. There was a there wasn't a maternity roost in there, so now they've got this area that's just for the bats. And as part of the license, no one else is allowed to go in there apart from the licensed ecologist. It's been designed for them and crevice dwelling bats as well. It's got some, uh, some crevices and panel boxes and woods in there. And it's just for the bats. And then if you can't designate an area of your loft or your new build to them, then you have to build them a separate loft. So this is a lovely bat house that's just you know, riffing. And uh, this is designed for brown long eards again. So it's got the nice open loft space inside, as well as crevice dwelling bats. It's got all these available crevices and entrance points under the woodland paneling around the outside. And 
think we've been monitoring this for a couple of years, but this year we had a bat come out of it. So they've started using it, which is good news. <laughs> it does take them a while to find these again, but when they do, they do use them. Okay. And then as most of the species in the UK, bat species are crevice dwelling, they don't require much space. So mitigation can be quite can be quite easy for them. Um, there's lots of bat boxes av available that you can use for crevice dwelling box, many different types that you can get inbuilt into the wall or you can get inbuilt into the loft or you can get, you know, slates designed where you can just put a slate on your roof and the bat can roost under it, it'll access slates. There's lots of different options. You can get these ones that hang up on trees or the exterior of buildings if you can't put it into your new build. I like you would a bird box and they do bat boxes for maternity roost, for hibernation roost, you know, normal bat boxes. There's lots of options there for crevice dwelling bats. However, must remember <laughs> that bats rely heavily on connectivity from tree and hedge lines for commuting and foraging. So just putting up a bat box or making a bat loft just in the middle of a development isn't going to enhance the site for bats if it doesn't have suitable or connecting habitat around it. So part of our mitigation does involve enhancing the area with tree and hedge planting, you know, and it creates food and it just, it, it gives them something to navigate to and from the site. And I'm not going to go into all that now because that's, again, <laughs> I think we could go on for hours, but this is just a, a quick overview and I hope it's give you an idea of, of what we do and how we survey for bats. And uh, I think all questions are going to be left to the end. So thank you very much for listening and I'll hand you back to Rian. Okay, so I'm going to talk a bit about dormouse surveys and how we do dormouse surveys for development purposes. So just a little bit about dormouse ecology, first of all. So dormice are arboreal, so they live up in the trees. And again, they are nocturnal as well. And they're one of the small mammals which actually truly hibernate. Um, as you can see from this picture there is a very furry tail and quite often when we were doing the dormouse project back in 2007 to 2010 we tried to find out more public records from dormice and quite often people would think they'd found a dormice but actually when they saw a picture of the furry tail they realized that actually it was just a wood mouse with you know slight fur on the tail. So it's a very obvious distinguishable feature for dormice. So dormice will have up to two litters of year of sorry, two litters of young a year. However, in North Wales, quite often it's only one. We are sort of at the most northern range of the dormice population. And um, I have seen a few litters in May or June when we've had really good springs, um, but it's not common. The most common is having um, young in September, which is quite late when you think how much weight they then have to put on to be able to hibernate successfully. Uh, dormice are relatively long-lived species for a small mammal. In the wild, they can live up to five years and in captivity up to seven years. And naturally, they're nesting hollow trees, in bramble thickets or in hollow branches as well. And then we use dormouse nest boxes to try and improvise a hollow tree. And that's why they're nesting in the dormouse boxes. So dormice actually hibernate at ground level. And the reason they do this is it's the most steady temperature. So they want to be as cold as possible and stay at that level throughout the winter. They don't want to be warming up and having to increase their metabolism and waking up and then going back into hibernation as this will use very valuable um, food resources. And I don't know if anyone saw, I think it was last week, there was a photo of a 40 gram dormouse down in South England somewhere, which got into a bird feeder and got a bit stuck basically. So that one should have no problem surviving hibernation. We usually say 15 to 20 grams to survive hibernation. There has appeared to be quite a large decline in dormouse numbers throughout the country in the last five years, which is quite worrying. Um, as the Wildlife Trust, we've been involved in a project with Chester Zoo, NRW, Denbyshire um, since 2015, I think, no, sorry, 2005, um, where we've actually been microchipping dormice in the woodland in Bontuchum, just outside of Rissen. 
and this has provided really useful information about the movements of dormice within the woodland and they've also there yeah, they've had the dormouse boxes on posts so when they're doing woodland management the dormouse boxes will be retained rather than being lost because trees are felled on them and that is part of the project to see how the woodland management affects the population in that woodland and um, this year might be the last year of microchipping because it's undergoing a bit of a change in project but we are going to continue monitoring there so the ideal habitat for dormice is really sort of an oak woodland with hazel understory, preferably coppiced with lots of hazelnuts. Um, however, a lot of the population is actually in suboptimal habitat and you do find dormice. It was always said you, you won't find dormice in conifer woodlands. However, you, you do, and especially in the edge of conifer woodlands where there is some broadleaf as well. And quite often you will get populations there. So it's quite hard to definitely say, oh, this habitat isn't suitable, there won't be dormice here. You have to keep an open mind. So there's several different dormouse survey methods. I'm going to cover all of these. However, not all of these would be used in consultancy due to the time scale. So the Dormice Conservation Handbook, which all but the latter footprint tunnels, all these survey methods are included within this handbook. And um, was published back in 2001, so it's quite old now. So we'll start off by having a look at nut hunts. So nut hunts is basically what it says. It's going out and looking for hazelnuts in woodlands. So dormice will open hazelnuts in a very specific way. So I always do an action, but you can't see it. Basically, they'll sit there with a dormice, with a hazelnut, and they will turn it which therefore leaves spiraling tooth marks on the inside of the hole. And then tooth marks at the edge of the hazelnut are going at an angle to the hole. So it is quite a distinguishable feature. Um, it's very, it's easy to see when you've got your eye into it, you're used to looking for it. And also it's easiest to see when the hazelnut is actually quite fresh still, because it's a lot easier to see the tooth marks on a green hazelnut rather than one which is a couple of months old and been decaying slowly. So to do a nut hunt, for, there are certain methods to use. So the way to do it is in a woodland, you need to set up 10 by 10 meter squares, and then you search that area for 20 minutes, looking for all the nuts you can find. Uh, you can do three squares per site, and there will be an 80% chance of finding a nut if dormice are there. And if you do five squares, and failed to find a nut, it's 90% certain that dormice are not present in that woodland. So dormice work well in this situation. So they work very well where there's a good hazel crop and a relatively high dormouse population density. And when you are getting a good number of hazelnuts, obviously the crop varies from year to year. It's best carried out in September, October as I mentioned, when the, when the nuts are fresh, it's much easier to see the tooth marks on it. And it's very low cost. It's one visit and it just takes a bit of time to look through all the nuts. The other way is you can also gather the nuts in, gather up to 100 and bring them back and have a look at them sort of in the office or home or whatever and have a look to see if there's any dormouse nuts that way rather than have to identify them on site. Uh, the issues are that quite a lot of dormice sites have little or no hazel and some years you obviously don't get many hazelnuts and also we also get a lot of squirrels which will decimate the, the nuts very quickly before dormice even get a chance to have them. So they are very useful but it, it's usually done in collaboration with another survey method. So this just shows the, how other small mammals open the hazelnuts. The main difference is these teeth marks. Um, so on the wood mouse and bank bowl, there are tooth marks going into the actual hole itself and they look like the edge of a ten pence. So if you look at the edge of the ten pence you'll see lots of little vertical tooth marks going down and that's what it will look like inside a nut. But you can also feel it with your finger as well. Um, but as I said, yeah, squirrels are ones which open the majority of the hazelnuts. So dormice nest boxes um, is the, by in I I think it's the best method basically to establish if dormice are present in the woodland. However, it's long term. You can't 
put them up in spring and expect the mice to have moved in by autumn. So if you're a development, it's very unlikely that they use dormice nest boxes to see if dormice are present, just due to the time which it would take. It can take three to five years before dormice will move into boxes. So we've been checking sites for a long time before we get any evidence of dormice. And the nests are easily recognisable, so it's very easy to determine if dormice are present using them, even if there's no dormice actually present in the nest at the time. Um, and there's a few photos here. It's not actually the best nest, that one, but usually it's quite a woven structure and then with green leaves around the outside. So you can see the green leaves here, but you can't really see the woven structure quite so much. And then there's more of an inside of the nest, so the woven honeysuckle there. You will also get a lot of other things using dormouse boxes as well. So you'll get wood mice and um, shrews and obviously birds. So when you're doing a survey for dormice in May or June, quite often the majority of them are actually occupied by birds. But dormice will then move into those nests later on in the year. Dormice nest tubes is the most common method for surveying dormice in, um, in the consultancy field due to the amount of time it takes to put them up and you have to survey them for quite a long period. So you have to put them up early in the year and survey them for the majority of the year during the active season. So if you can get the boxes up in, well, the tubes up in April, you'll then have to survey them every month through to the end of September. And you have to use a minimum of 50 tubes at 20 meter intervals. And there's an index of probability and you have to get a score of 20 to show that you put in enough um, sufficient survey effort to prove if dormice are or aren't present. So as you can see, to get 20, they'd need to go up in April so you can start checking in May. And then by September, you'll get your 20. So it's enough to say that you've done the survey effort required. So these are quite often collaborated with the dormouse nut hunts as well, if there's suitable habitat for a nut hunt. So this is what a dormouse nest tube looks like. It's a bit of corrugated black plastic with a plywood. And the idea is the hollow branch, which lies underneath uh, a horizontal branch on the tree, and the dormice will go in there and make a nest. They use them quite readily down in South England, especially in hedgerows. So they will find quite a large number of dormouse nests in these. Um, in North Wales, we have found some, but obviously it's a lot wetter, the habitats, um, sorry, the climate's different up here to down in South England. So I'm a bit more wary about using them, but it is one of the methods which we have to use. Um, this was from years ago. So this was a project as part of the dormouse project. Um, where we tried to use hair tubes to see if these would um, find any dormice present. It was a survey method which isn't used that often, but can be very successful. And um, basically it's a little, it's like a water, water pipe basically. And um, so quite small and you cut holes in it and then put sellotape over the holes and bait it with peanut butter. And the idea is that if an individual goes through this, it will leave hair on the sellotape and you then use a microscope to determine what, what hair it is and if it's from a dormouse. And when we did it, we had a few suspect hairs, but when we sent them away to Pat Morris, who is the, the dormouse person, basically, um, they weren't, unfortunately. But it is quite a good technique to use. But again, it's not one which is sort of recognised one within consultancy, but it could, could be used to survey. And it is also one of those, it, it, you get an instant result, so you're not going back for months on end to try and see if it's almost a present. The other method is actually searching for the nests. Um, I'd never do a survey just doing this, but obviously it's something which we do if we have to supervise works and check areas before construction then we are obviously looking for nests, but it's not a survey method I would use to try and find out if dormice were there. Um, again, down in the south, they have done this and they found dormouse nests naturally in hedgerows. And in Europe, I think they, they monitor some of the sites from natural nests as well. 
another technique, which is a relatively new technique, I think it's sort of 2014, so six years old now, um, but is using footprint tunnels. Um, it's quite an easy way of doing it. I, I haven't used it myself, and um, I'd be quite interested to see how how easy it is when you're actually comparing footprints when you when you get them on the ink pad. Um, and it reduces the time compared to nest tubes. However, you do have to visit it quite more often because you have to re-ink the ink pad to make sure that the footprint would collect enough ink to leave, leave a good print on it. With the footprint tunnels, it's actually quite a good success rate. So if you put 50 footprint tunnels and leave them for three months, so May to October, um, it should detect with 97.5% certainty if there are dormice present there. So again, you would still be doing six visits because you have to visit twice a month. So as um, with bats, dormice are protected species, both Wildlife and Countryside Act and European protected species. And again, this is very similar as Kumar mentioned for the bats. So you have to assess the favourable conservation status of the species and looking at the habitat, especially for dormice because they're so reliant on connectivity. Um, so this can be key if it's just some woodland thinning, then that would probably be fine. If it's removal of a hedge, then obviously that's going to be a lot more detrimental to dormice. So again, mitigation and conversation would be included in the ecology report and the planning application submitted. And then if that goes ahead, a license will then be required from NRW detailing the mitigation and monitoring which is required. Um, and again, this work would require supervision. So with dormice, uh, it is quite similar to bats with regards to time of year. The works which are carried out really depends on the key times of year that you're doing it. So if you're doing anything which is going to damage the woodland floor, you need to be doing that when dormice are active because you don't want vehicles or machinery going over the forest floor when dormice are in hibernation. So the ideal time to do this is of September into October before they go into hibernation and then April into May before they start breeding. If it is just some woodland thinning work, and it's not going to be machinery, it's just going to be a case of felling and leaving on the ground, then that can be done over winter as long as it's not going to have too much of an impact on, on the actual floor of the woodland. So as I mentioned, um, we carry out um, supervision work. So if work is being carried out on the site, we'll have to go and check to make sure there's no nests beforehand. Um, and any potential for hibernation if there is any work going on in winter. However, as mentioned, this is avoided wherever possible. And habitat enhancement for dormice is usually, well, mitigation and enhancement, so dormice boxes erected. However, obviously this only provides sort of extra nesting potential for dormice, it doesn't enhance the habitat for them for feeding. So often this is also associated with and um, planting and woodland management as well. So over the years when I've been involved in consultancy, there's been very few dormouse projects actually come in because it's quite rare that a development is going to affect dormouse habitat and the dormouse population in North Wales is relatively low. So the risk of impacting on dormice in a lot of the sites is quite low. Um, so the ones I've been involved with is we were involved in the Cocainog wind farm. We carried out ecological clock work during the construction of the wind farm. And here they had dormouse boxes which they'd put up prior to works, which we monitor, we monitored for two or three years now. And actually the numbers here are increasing, which is quite nice and quite different from the rest of the story we're hearing from other places in the UK. Um, there's a North Wales Wind Farm Connections project, which is the connection from Crookenog Wind Farm, the pylon route down to St Asaph, and they erected dormouse nest tubes and some boxes in woodlands and hedgerows along, along the way, so we monitor those. Another project we've been involved with is Network Rail, and this was with another consultancy down in South Wales, where 
they were dangerous trees, so they had no choice, they had to be felled. So here, that was clearance of the ground around the trees and literally fingertip search. So you are literally on your hands and knees looking for potential nests. And then they fell it and make habitat connectivity piles. And they will be doing some habitat enhancement through woodland management and putting up some boxes for long-term monitoring as well. And the most common one I've been involved with is um, through ProAlb for SP Energy, which is where the electricity lines, we, they have to maintain a safe distance. So it's unlikely that trees are going to fall on them. Um, so here we've been involved in a few projects and the work here is usually pretty low potential. It's coppicing and it's just cutting back to make sure that the trees are far enough away. But whenever this is in close proximity to a dormouse site, we get involved and get a license and make sure the work's done as it should be. And the other one is another site near Clokenog. You can see where the dormice are populated in North Wales, which is where a hedgerow had to be removed for a school. So another hedgerow was planted which linked up to um, one of the woodlands where we know dormice were present and then enhancement carried out and dormice boxes within that woodland. So there, that's a brief overview of some dormice works and some projects which we have been involved with. And that's, that's pretty much everything. So has anyone got any questions at all? Uh, hello, uh, it's Susan here. Um, just a minute, as my video.